Blessings to you. Good evening. Welcome to yet another edition of Core Principles of the Kingdom, brought to you by the kind courtesy of the wonderful people at Come As You Are Ministries, located in Central Amelia's Ward, where Apostle Cleveland Thomas lives. We are so happy to know that on a weekly basis we can bring truth right into your home. We are delighted to know that the word of the Lord is still true. It is yea and it is amen. It is forever settled in heaven. We give the Lord glory for the family of Come As You Are Ministries, which happen to be those at Core Ministries International, located in East Orange, New Jersey, as well as those in Pleasance, Guyana, at Christ to the Nations Apostolic Ministries. We are delighted. We are happy. We are overjoyed. It's a blessing to hear that the Lord has chosen his people in this time to speak truth without fear, to speak his word with clarity, with boldness, and with much authority. I thank the Lord for what he's doing here in this town of Linden, even in the life of my brother, my co-laborer, Apostle Cleveland Thomas, the wonderful folk that come as your ministries. I cannot speak enough about them. Uh, those who have sought it, uh, seen it fit to make contributions to this telecast, we're so del delighted. We will not be on, on air seeking your contribution from the public because we believe that if ever the Lord gives us an assignment, he shall make a way. Tonight, I will continue to speak to what is necessary and needed for the church. That is order. The church of Adonai, the church of Elohim. And let me say these Hebrew words, and some of you wonder, why does he say that? Because the Lord made it very clear to me that his name will be made known among his people. His name, Shem is the word, or it means Shem is pronounced in English. But his name, Shem in Hebrew, his name shall be made known. How can you know someone's name if you don't get familiar with it? We have to acquaint ourselves with his name. We must be familiar with what his name is. His name, I'll give you a brief uh, synopsis of this, or a synopsis of it, I mean progress. His name, the name of God, as you call it, is Adonai. That's his name, Adonai. Jehovah is how he speaks to his people consistently, how he manifests himself. For example, he did something in Abram's life. Uh, when he provided a ram in the thicket, Abram said his name is, the place is called Jehovah Yireh, which means the Lord shall see to it. You say, provide. Okay? Uh, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is my peace. Of course, you know that. And so whenever he manifested himself to his people, they call the name Jehovah and give a, a, a memorial. This, that's a memorial now. Okay? Elohim is what you call God or, or majesty. Elohim is a tricky term because Elohim can speak to even me or you or the mayor or someone of great uh, societal influence. A great person is called Elohim. All right? But we have to get familiar with his name. Why do you say Adonai? Adonai as well is important because Adonai, the Hebrew people, of course, the Romans chapter 1 says salvation is of the Jews first, then the Gentiles. It's of the Jews first. If it's of the Jews first, then we must get familiar with them. We must understand how they function. The Jews have so much respect, so much regard for the name Yahweh that they don't even say it. They rather say Adonai. So whenever you hear a Jewish person saying Adonai, it means master or sir. Like manner, if you go to Jerusalem, you will hear a Jewish person look at you if you're a man and say, Adonai, maybe he'll say that to you. It doesn't mean you're God. It simply means he has respect for you. But in the Jewish culture, when they speak about him, we understand when they're speaking to it. Okay? Now, in the book of Titus, I want to speak to us again about what, is, what has become the new enemy of the church, which is rebuke. The church has a difficult time, a hard time understanding correction in these last days. Why is that so important? Because the Lord did testify to it. Yeshua said that in the last days there will be a falling away. He said that's a sign of his coming, and that's a sign of the end of the age, when there will be a great falling away. The term in, in, in theology is called uh, apostasy. Apostasy means to fall away, and apostate is a person who has fallen away from the truth. They've departed from the faith, and usually those who depart from the faith are those who would have given heed to seductive spirits. Seductive spirits are dangerous spirits in the church. What they do is they draw you away, they isolate you, and then they indoctrinate you. They pull you away from the, from the solid foundations of the faith, and they pour into you what is not even scriptural. A seductive spirit is not one who tells you to leave a church. Now mind you, let me be careful with you here tonight. A seductive spirit doesn't tell you to leave a ministry. A seductive spirit tells you to walk away from the truth. So some preachers will be around saying, don't follow this person, don't listen to that person, don't look at the next one, um, they're seducing you. No, no, no. No. Whenever a, a, someone wants to draw you away from the truth, that is seduction. They'll pull you to yourself and pour into you what the scripture did not say. The, the only thing that is called truth 
in the vocabulary of Jehovah is what he has said to his people. Amen. What he has written or what he has uttered. And only those who are his sheep can tell what he's uttered indeed. So in the church, persons have now gotten a cultural development where, where, where they despise correction. They have formed for themselves doctrines. They have started to teach themselves. They don't even have the attitude to say they shall receive instructions from the Lord's leadership. When you have that happening in the body, what you, what you definitely get is apostasy. Whenever persons refuse to follow the structure that Jehovah, that Yeshua set up for the ministry, you will have apostates. You will have people speaking ignorantly. You will have people speaking in and of themselves. And once they begin to speak of themselves, they will no longer stand on any foundation. The foundation on which the churches stand are on two, is the apostles and the prophets, who are appointed by Yeshua. Not what we think. Not what we feel. Let me help, let me help you carefully, please, tonight. And a, a pastor, an evangelist, or a teacher is, is not the foundation of the church. The scripture says in Ephesians, the church is founded on two, the apostle and the prophet. Amen. The pastor, the evangelist, the teacher, they are just the, 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 the structure that are built on the foundation. They stand on the shoulders of the apostles and the prophets, and they're able to help the body. But the, the day they begin to despise the foundation, they have no foundation themselves. They shall begin to crumble. Their teaching shall crumble. There's nothing for them to stand on. So Paul the Apostle is writing to the church by the Spirit of the Lord. And what I'm here to do tonight is to show you and help you to understand, one, what apostolic authority is, and secondly, to bring correction to some of the things you've heard in this town. The church in Linden must know the truth. Note I said Amen. the church in Linden because there's only one. Amen. The church in Linden must know the truth. The denominations, you could do what you want to do. The, the independents do what you want to do. But if you are the church, you shall know the truth. A true believer in the Lord will never despise his apostles. A true believer in the Lord will never de despise his prophets, neither his evangelists, pastors, or teachers. You shall have regard and respect for them. Now, in Titus, Paul is writing, Paul, a slave, a slave of Theos, in Greek, but he uh, was called Yahweh, or Jehovah, an apostle of, Yehusha, uh, of Yeshua HaMashiach. That's called Jesus Christ in English, you would say, but Jesus is not a Hebrew word. Yeshua HaMashiach, according to the faith of the elect of God, and full knowledge of truth according to godliness, on hope of eternal life, which God, that does not lie, promised before the eternal times. He promised it before eternal times, but revealed it in his own times, in a proclamation of his word, with which I was entrusted by the command of our Savior, Elohim, or Yahweh. Verse 4, he's writing to Titus, a true child, according to our common faith. Titus is called a son of Paul. I cannot say this enough to the churches. There are those who join us on a weekly basis, also in Periscope, it's an app on your phone. Some of you in this town also follow me on it. Uh, tell it Periscope is an app that allows you to stream live across the world from your cell phone. And those who join me by, tel by Periscope, I want you to hear me as well. The scripture to the church is laden with terminologies of sons and child in ministries. Understand that. The reason why there's so much chaos in the body is because persons have departed from that basic principle. If ever you have no father, you don't have an imparter. Hear me carefully. If you have no father, there's no one who imparts to you. Now, persons get, would get up and say, well, the Lord teaches me. The Lord is the one who talks to me. Uh, God talks to me himself. Well, that means you should be a father. If ever you're someone to whom the Lord speaks directly and gives direct instructions, it is not for secret. It's for his body. You should produce something out of you. But what I'm hearing more often than not is a rebellious bunch who refuse to submit to anyone claiming that they don't have fathers. Well, the scripture said it. It's written right here. Why do you read the scripture if you're going to doubt what you see? The scripture says Paul is writing to Titus, a son, a child of his. He's defined as a child because the father is imparting, and you will see it. You will see whereby the father, Paul, could instruct the son Titus. Now, Titus has got the grace to teach. He's got a responsibility to appoint, which makes him an apostle. But Titus also respects somebody above him. It does not mean Titus is less than Paul. That's exactly what is causing the church trouble. There's such a power drunkenness in the church. We, everybody wants power, whereby they don't understand the power of submission. The principle is that there will always be fathers and sons. To the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 4, the apostle Paul said, you may have many instructors. Anybody could teach you. 
but he said you could only have one father, and he did not say it was Abba. He said, it is me, Paul, for you are begotten by my gospel. Why would you read these things in scripture and don't believe it? Even Yeshua had a father figure in the person of Yos Yosef. Yosef, which is Joseph, you say in English. He had a father figure. They said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Because he was put under somebody to lead him. Who took him to Egypt when he was a boy? Look at the principle spiritually. Who took him down to Egypt with his mother? Yosef. Who did the angel speak to when the child was in danger of Herod killing him? Yosef. Why? Because the angel knows principle. A father cares for a baby. How could you be born in the faith and have no father? Who produced you then? You're not of God. If ever you're born claiming to be born into the faith and you have no father to point to you and not of the Lord, you're not even saved. Because somebody had to preach a message of salvation to reach you. So who begot you? Who preached the gospel to you to beget you? If you can't identify that person, I question your salvation and I will never listen to you because it means you are a, you are a loner. So Yehoshua was given a father figure. He was given a mother. Watch this. At the age of 12, when he was lost in the temple at the feast, when they found him, he said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? Yeah, okay, fine. He said, Abba. But from that time, he was given the mandate from the age of 12 to the age of 30 for 18 years. The scripture said it. He was under the authority of his parents. Read your Bible. That's why you read it every morning. The scripture says Yehoshua was under the authority of his parents. Under whose authority are you? Apostle Raymond Wells, Apostle Andrew Farkas, and they're my fathers. I call him an apostle and an apostle Basil Smart. That's my father. These are the men who produce something in me at different phases in my life. Of course, Errol London is my biological father. And I still submit to him. We must understand the principle. What has happened in the church is, I know, I know it hurts some of you. Some men went, went children fishing. They fish for sons and daughters. I'm not talking to you. Because you're a hypocrite yourself. I'm not talking to those who go out and say, man, come on, man, you need to be my son. Let me, let me father you. You don't do that. You don't buy sons. They're appointed to you. They're given to you by divine assignment. And you don't choose fathers. Amen. Holy Spirit, Rak HaKadosh will tell you to submit to this man. And usually, it will be somebody you can't stand for long. They get under your skin. They rebuke you too much. You can't take it if you're weak. Fathers will rebuke you to perfection. They shall chastise you into, into living right. They will never tolerate your being doing foolishness. So most preachers don't want fathers because they don't want to submit to anybody. But the scripture has it written. Now Paul said, I'm writing to Titus, I'm writing to Titus, a child according to our common faith. Grace, mercy, peace from Jehovah, the Father, or Elohim the Father, and the Lord Yehoshua, our Savior. For this cause I left you in Crete. First, uh, that's Titus chapter uh, 1 verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you might set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I ordered you. Listen to the scriptural language. Paul is writing to Titus and telling him what to do. He said, appoint elders in every city as I would have ordered you or instructed you to do it. Now, those of you lone rangers out there who don't listen to anybody, where is your father to give you this kind of instruction? Or to whom are you giving this instruction? Nobody. So what is your apostolic duty then? If there's nobody for you to instruct, you're just speaking to yourself. There has to be someone who respects you enough by your life in the Lord Amen. for you to be able to give them instructions. So Paul said, listen, Titus, set in place those people whom I've left you to do it. He said, you must appoint elders. Titus, you must appoint elders. Now, I'm going somewhere with this tonight to correct the church. He said to Titus, appoint elders. He didn't say, Titus, call the church together. Let the church have an election and elect elders. He never said that. He said, you must appoint them. One person appoint them. There are persons in the body who usually don't understand this principle. So they feel that the church must have elections for office bearers. What is that? What is that? Elections are governed in a democratic society. You are in a theocracy. You got, theos is God. Crassy is governance. God governs. Democracy, demo is people. Crassy is governance. The, the Abnu AFC was elected by the people. Therefore, they're governed by the people. It's called representation. 
But in the kingdom of, of, of Adonai, it doesn't work like that. It works by a term called sovereignty. He is in charge and he gives authority to whom he wills, like governors, and he sets them forth in the earth and you better respect them. Amen. And those whom he set up on his church will have a heart to love his people. Jehovah never puts over the church slave drivers. He never puts over the church slave masses. He never assigns to the church those who will hurt the body. He will always put over his people those who have his spirit. He will never put an empty vessel to lead his people. And many people in the church are sitting before empty vessels because you submitted to denomination instead of to the Lord himself. Titus was given an instruction to appoint elders. He never, the scripture never said that you must vote for them. He said appoint them and then you must ordain them as I've given you instruction to do so. So where did the church get this concept from that you vote for pastors to lead you? Where did that come from? Where do you have it in the scripture where you vote? Okay, I'll tell you where it came from. In Acts chapter 1, you shall say that they gathered in the house and they prayed. And then they said, Lord, you have, we asked that you give us someone to replace Judas who went to his own place. And they cast lots. And the Lord fell on Matthias. And he said, oh, yes, yes, you see that? They voted in the Bible. Well, I'm here to give you correction tonight. Because, first of all, to cast lot in the Hebrew culture doesn't mean to vote. Jews don't vote. Cast a lot means that they would put names on, in Guyana, you say paper, or you may say a, a slate, but in the language of the day, it's called a pot shirt. It's when you break a vase. Americans say vase. You break the vase, it's shattered in pieces of the clay pots. They write the person's names on it. Put it in another clay pot that's whole. Shake that pot and then they cast the lot. To cast means to throw. When they throw the, the lot of names in there, whichever name came out first, ahead of all the rest, they said that person is what the Lord wanted us to do. Does that sound like voting to you? Not to me. They never voted for Matthias. They cast or they threw the lot. Secondly, when Yehoshua was on the cross, the soldiers began to cast lots to get his garment. Did they vote to get it? Let's go by the principle you try to talk. They didn't vote to get it. They didn't, vote, they didn't have an election to see who get the cloak. They wrote their names on, on, a, on the same principle they knew the culture. They put it in a, in, a, in a jar. They shook it. When they threw it, whoever name came out first, that person got Messiah's robe or cloak. Oh, this is a big one. <laughs> Jonah. I call his name in English for you. Is on the boat. Headed to Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. What happened to him? A storm met Jonah. The sailors cast lots. And the lot fell on Jonah. Did the sailors vote to see if it was Jonah? Now cut the foolishness out, please. There's no scripture that supports voting in the church. It does not exist. Amen. It doesn't exist. In, in the book of Acts, you want to go there, let's go there too. In the book of Acts, when there was a problem in the, with the Hellenists, Hellenists are Jews who spoke Greek. The Hellenists were not being cared for. After the Spirit of the Lord moved and people began to bring the, uh, uh, the items, the people were not caring for the Jews who spoke Hebrew. The apostles said, we are going to give ourselves to prayer and to the word. You find for yourselves seven men. And there's a criteria. They must be full of the Spirit. They must have a good reputation. Amen. They must be full of the Spirit and have a good reputation. Amen. Most pastors I know are disqualified from that first two statements. They must be full of the Spirit and have a good reputation. If your Amen. reputation is not good, you're not a pastor. Amen. If you do not have a good reputation in Linden, you should not be leading God's people. Amen. If everybody in Linden knows more about you than you do yourself, because some of you don't even know the sins you commit. It's a nasty thing when a pastor can be sinning and don't know he's sinning. Or you can't admit your sin. A wicked man will hide his error. A righteous one will confess it and move forward. Now, if, if you have a poor reputation and you don't have Holy Spirit, you should not be leading the church. So he said, now you find, the, the apostle said, you find these people. Once you find them, find. They will set, set, find seven men. They found seven men, Stephen, Nicona, and all the others. Watch it carefully. None of them was considered a pastor. It never said that they were gifts. They were given administrative responsibility. They were not called gifts. They were given administrative responsibility. Now hear me carefully, please. There is no scripture that supports the election of an elder. If ever you are an elected elder, you need to reconsider what you really are. The church is supposed to have an apostolic authority over it. 
as well as elders over her. Now, in some churches, you find they say, well, you cannot be a deacon, but you should be an elder. <laughs> you shouldn't be a deacon, but you'll be an elder. Diaconus is someone who serves in administration or authority over the church. Elder speaks to someone who has a position in what is called a Sanhedrin. In other words, they sit in a place of authority over the whole church. So the deacons really are not, do not have as much authority as an elder. Yet the churches will say, you were divorced before, sir, so uh, since you were divorced, you could be an elder, you can't be a deacon. What are you doing? What are we really doing, church? Because you don't have apostles, you will always do what is in error. Now please hear me in the right spirit tonight. If you are of God, you will fix this. First of all, you don't vote for elders. That's the first thing. Now, this is big. This is major right here. Some of you fight, you turn the TV off, you'll say, I won't listen to him anymore. Some of you in the phone, you cut your phone off right now when I say what I have to say right here. Throughout the scripture from Genesis to Revelation, there's only once where the word elder, which is a, an adjective, it describes a noun, is used in a feminine sense. And it's right in Titus. But Timothy, sorry, when he said, you elder, you older women, train the younger women, I think it's in Titus, yes, to be wives to their husbands and mothers to their children. Every other sense or usage of the term is masculine. Why is that so important? Because in, in Jerusalem, in the new Jerusalem, and when, when Yochadon, John, you call him, had a vision of, of, of heaven and Yeshua. You know what he saw? A revelation of Yeshua, you know what he saw? He saw elders. He saw 24 of them. None was male. Don't fight this thing. In Ephesians 4, 11, he gives gifts to the body. He gives some to be apostles, some prophet, some evangelist, some pastor, some teacher. That terminology is, or when he gives gifts to men, is anthropos. All, anybody, male or female, is not gender, gender controlled. So you could have a female apostle, you could have a female prophet, you could have a female evangelist, pastor, teacher. But you can't have an administrative responsibility over the kingdom, female elders. It doesn't happen in the church. Now, you could fight it, but it's just the truth. All right? And I've come to a place in my life where I've understood that anyone who fights the truth is not of the truth. Amen. Females, yes. Anna in Luke chapter 2 is called a prophetess. She's in the New Testament. Anna is a prophetess. She's described as a prophetess. You've got that in Scripture. You could have females who are pastors, but the, 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 the principle is tied into rulership over men, dominion over men. It should not happen in the church. I did not say that a woman can't preach in the church. Don't misquote what I said. Because that word gune is wife of a leader. If you are the wife of a leader, you should not be having authority over him in the church. Too much of this is happening in the, in the body. You have women in the church who are called first ladies. First of all, that's not a biblical term. Yes, you use it. I call my wife girlfriend. Her name is Tanera. But don't ever come to me with a thought that says, because she is my wife, she has more rights than everybody else in the church. And she has some peculiar position whereby she's untouchable. That is not scripture. And what is happening to the churches is most people, their wives are ruling the church, not the husbands. Okay. I came to speak to you. The book said that if you cannot govern your house well, you should take a seat. You must not leave God's people. And some pastors in this community and out there, you look, look by YouTube later on when I put this up, your wife is controlling the church. If the wife says there's no Christmas dinner, you get up and say, God said we're going to have a Christmas dinner. No, your wife said it. Not no God said anything. You don't have power to even correct her at home. My wife doesn't get up in the church and take the mic from me and I'm preaching and say, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, here. The spirit isn't right in here. She will not do that because she understands her place. Some of you say, well, you see, he's like the boss. He, doesn't, he rules his wife. I'm supposed to. The scripture says you are supposed to govern your house as a man. If you can't govern your house, you can't govern your children. How are you talking to people's children in the church? Amen. How could your wife be telling you what to do in the church? Right. She could call the, the church a meeting. She could, some, she could tell the singer, stop singing, stop singing. I have something to say. You have nothing to say. Tell your husband. And don't tell me to be quiet because I'm talking louder now. Tell your husband, if you can't speak to your husband in private, you're not a wife. You are a rebellious woman. And you need to take a seat and learn in silence. That's what you're talking to. When he said learn in silence, he's talking to people like that, who have no respect for their husband's authority. 
if you are not gifted, it means you're not graced for the pulpit. Oh, I just said something to you all right there. If you are not gifted, it means you are not graced for the pulpit. You don't get a pul pulpit position because you're somebody's wife. He said he give some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. If you don't have that, it means you don't have the grace to function any of the gifts. So what are you talking for? Why do you have a mic in your hand? Why is it when it's, when it's women's ministries days or uh, Mother's Day, the wife of the pastor must preach? You're not a preacher. You cannot rightly divide the word of truth to what you're saying. If your husband can't correct you, I will. Because the scripture said, the apostle Paul wrote to the church and addressed the wives of the church. The gune in, in Greek. Gune is the wife especially of a leader. Ask your husband at home. Don't disrupt no church service. And some of you men, you can't answer your wife at home because you're a deacon without power. You have no knowledge of scripture. You are a misplaced deacon. You don't spend time in the book. You spend time opening the church door, close the church door. Clean the pastor car, sweep the church. Deacon don't cut grass, that's not a deacon. You have the responsibility to teach. That's your job. Your job is to teach. When they appointed the seven men, their job was to distribute. But Stephen was functioning in power. He was healing the sick. He did many signs and wonders. When they challenged Stephen, Stephen got up in Acts chapter 6, I think it is, and he preached to them. He's the one who said that God don't dwell in temples made with hands. Hello, you house of God people. Stephen said he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He doesn't do that. You can't build no house for him. He said in David write that, what house can I make for you? The earth is your footstool. The heaven is your habitation. Where does he live? He's too big. Everything is found in him. Nothing could exist outside of him. So what, what, what house are you building for him? Hallelujah. You cannot build a house for him. We are his houses. He built us for him. We didn't make ourselves. He made us. And he put himself in us. We are now the living temples. We are the living tabernacles of the Lord. That's what we are. We are building blocks to build his body up. So Paul said, you need to appoint the elders. Verse 6, if anyone is blameless. You see it right here? Husband of one wife. See the terminology? So you say, well, that's just culture. No, God is not cultural. God is kingdom. Jehovah is kingdom, not culture. Culture is get you into trouble. He's kingdom. In the kingdom, he said, an elder must be the husband of a wife. My father, Erolano, is an elder in the church. Why is he an elder in the church? Because I see how he treats my mother. He raised me to be who I am today. He has trained me well. Up until now, I respect him. If I have a problem with my wife, I call my father. Because he has the authority to speak to me and my family. I respect him highly. He's demonstrated to me what it is to respect a woman. How could you have an elder in the church who can't respect his wife? How could you have an elder in the church who can't rule his own children? Let me read the scripture for you. He must be the husband of one wife. Having believing children. Church, hear me Linden. Any elder who has a family whose children, his sons and daughters don't believe, he's not an elder. He's an imposter. You cannot be an elder if your children are unbelievers. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. And you may be upset, but that's the scripture. You must have believing children. Shemaria, Shekinah, Regina must be believing children. All of my father's children are believers. Every last one of us. Because we looked at him and saw the Lord in his life. But what happens to some people is, you are one thing at church. And when you get home, you're no longer elder. You're diabolus. You're a devil. You drink liquor in the house and think your children don't see you. You, you fritz stack with beer. Ask me now if you could drink beer as an elder. I'll answer you. Call the number. Call the number on the screen. 6003792. You are, if you are an elder, why are you asking if it's okay to drink alcohol? Why? Why is it as an elder when your friends come over, you, you drunk with all of them? Some of you travel to the U.S. And when you get to, I know you. Because you forget I live in the States. When you get to the U.S., you become a different person. I've seen so many preachers in the United States of America, I wonder if you are still saved. And you come back to Guyana with a saved posture. The Lord is in the U.S. too. Wherever you travel in this world, he's there. Some of you bishops and stuff, you carry your girlfriend to different islands and have sex to please your heart. You fill your stomach with it. Then you come back home to Guyana and you're suddenly a man of God again. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord first. I'm warning you all, all the time. 
I'm warning you seriously here. You must have believing children. You must know how to govern yourself. It says you must not, not in a custom or accusation. You must be above reproach. You must not be accused of loose behavior. It's in the Bible. It's in the scripture. An elder must not be accused of having loose behavior. You can't be sleeping with the women in the church and be called elder. You must not even be accused of it. I'm talking church wise. No feeling was coming for the, the, the apostle and said the apostle, this man was sleeping with me last night as an elder. You must be blameless. How you could have an elder preaching that everybody sin, man, I got weakness, everybody has weakness, and you preaching sin to the church? You cannot be an elder. You will not be an elder. He said you must not also be unruly. For the overseer, so you see the interchange between elder and overseer now. Timothy was, it spoke of an overseer, now you see overseer and elder is intertwined in, 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 in uh, Titus. The overseer, which is the word bishop used in English, must be blameless. The overseer must be blameless. I said to you all one more time. The overseer must be blameless. You know how preachers who are bishops preaching about sinning every day. And this grace message whereby, oh God knows I'm, I'm human and I sin all the time. I sin every day. But his mercy keeps me. You're a bishop? You're not a bishop. You are an imposter. And I'm here to expose you so Lenin can know you by name. You're not an elder in the church. If ever you are an elder who preaches sin with grace attached to it, you're not an elder. You are a saint of, the, of Satan. Because only his people preach sin all the time. The people of the kingdom of Jehovah preach grace, which leads to repentance, which leads to salvation, which is a change of life. We don't preach sin, which leads to more sin, and more sin with grace hanging somewhere around the back of the corner. We preach grace, which leads to repentance, which leads to change of behavior. Amen. So you must also be a steward of God. As a steward of God, you must be blameless, not self-pleasing, not self pleasing. I hope you see how many people are being disqualified as I speak tonight. When it's all about the leader. Wash my car, bathe my dog. Wash my clothes, wash my shirt. Press this. Uh, do that. Do that. Do that. Uh, you have to wait. Tell you have to wait outside to see the person arrive. He's like the president now. He must have an entourage. It's all about this one person. Oh my, if there's a shortage of food, feed the other first. That's not in the book here. You must not be self-pleasing. It's not all about you. Even at communion, even at communion, I make it my duty to say, serve the others first. Serve the others first. When we eat the Lord's body and drink his blood, I say, serve the others first. Then come back to me. Because even in that, I must eat last. If they run out, I must not have any. But we have got a twist in the church whereby the elders have got the bishops. Oh, you, you, got, you treat it as if you're God in the earth. That's why so many young men are afraid of y'all. They don't want anything to do with you because you've, you've twisted what the truth is. You've become lords over the Lord's people. Peter talked to you about it. You must not lord over God's heritage. You must not do that. You're not supposed to be domineering God's people and have an attitude that says, everything is for me first. So what we said now, you must be hospitable. Do not be greedy for ill gain you must not be a quarreler. Like the row. Like the fight. The minute I preach this tonight, you go on the pulpit. Don't listen to the boy. He's not of God. Don't listen to the man. And you begin to fuss. If I come to teach you this tonight, you'll fight. Some of you females out there. If I told you what the scripture said, well, he can't talk to me. I'll still be an elder. Be it. Be that. You'll be misnamed. Because first of all, elder and deacon is not a noun. It's an adjective. It describes what you do. It's not a title that you have. It's not a title that you have. Apostolus is noun. Prophetess is noun. Evangelist, noun. Pastor, noun. Teacher, noun. Deacon, adjective. Elder, adjective. Read the book. Read a grammar book and see what they mean. Check it out. See what an adjective is and what a noun is. So Peter was called an elder. You know why? He's an apostle though. But it describes what he does. So he's one who sat in the council to give rulership over the church. That is why in Acts 15, when had a problem with men, tis, it's called in Greek, men said, listen, you need to be circumcised to be saved. 
And Paul and Barnabas, he said there was no easy contention among them. Paul got mad with them. Paul said, this is not right. And there was, a, there was a battle, there was a dispute. So what the people said was, okay, we're going to send you to the elders and to the apostles. To the elders and to the apostles, because every apostle is not an elder. Peter was married, that's why he's called an elder. Paul was not called an elder because he wasn't married. So they sent them to the apostles and the elders. James was one. Peter was one. And read Acts. This, the elders and the apostles wrote a letter to the church and said, leave these people alone. You are Jews and you couldn't even keep the law yourself. So leave them alone. Let them abstain from sexual immorality and from blood. It's in your scripture. You know how many times it's in the scripture? It's right there. So an elder is an adjective. It describes what somebody does. So when I speak of the Peter as an elder, Cephas as an elder, it means he sat in the Sanhedrin. He had authority to, to legislate over the church, to tell them what is right, to tell them what they should not do. Let me hasten to, to bring this to an end. He said now, the clinging to the faith, verse 9, clinging to the faithful word according to the teaching. Clinging to the faithful word according to the teaching that he may be able to both encourage with sound teaching and to convict the one speaking against or speaking contrary. The job of an elder is to encourage the church but also to do what? To convict the ones who speak against the truth. If an elder is unsound in the doctrine, how can he correct anybody? Now I'm married. I have the authority to speak to you because I know the truth. That's why I told you you don't vote for people. You don't elect any, 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 any pastor. You do not elect apostles. You don't elect bishops. They're not elected. And if ever somebody is functioning contrary, an elder must come and speak to you from the scripture. Correct you with the scripture only. Not with I think, not with I feel, not with the constitution, not with the bylaws, not with the credos. They must speak to you directly from scripture. And if you cannot receive the scripture, you've exposed who you are. That's how elders identify you. If ever an elder comes to you, an apostle comes to you and gives you scripture and you fight, you have the devil. You could be preaching for 40 years and still be of the devil. Whenever truth comes before you, it identifies who you are. It shows who you are. How do you feel about the truth tonight? What would you do on Sunday when you get to service on Saturday? What would you do tomorrow in your church? Would you, would you stand and fight this kind of truth out here? The Seventh-day Adventists have elders, females. You are out of order too. You are out of order. You vote against making a female a pastor, but you can make a female an elder when the, when the biblical terminology for elder is masculine. You are out of order. And I advise you to change it because he gave gifts to men. Anthropos is Greek. Anthropos is humanity. But elder is masculine. You go to Greek if you teach, if you're an Adventist pastor, you know the truth. You go to, you do study Greek for one year in, in CUT, in, in the Adventist college. Not CUT, but you understand, you know the truth. So let's go, Let, let's get this clear here. So he said the elder must be able to encourage with sound doctrine and to convict the one speaking against it. I came to Linden to deal with you, speak against the truth. That's my job, to tell the whole of Linden that you lie. So whenever they get up on Sunday or Saturday and they say, I want to go to church, they will go and hear the truth. And if you're not speaking the truth, they will identify it. That's what my job is. My job is not to send people to a liar. My job is to direct them to the truth. I don't send them to me. I'm sending them to the truth, which is the book, which is the spirit of truth as well. If he inspired this to be written, then I must preach this only. And anybody bringing you correction must bring you correction from the book only. Nobody must correct you from their head. They must correct you from the book alone. Amen. From the book. So whenever correction is coming, the preachers must preach the book to correct you. They must preach the book to correct you. Next week we'll pick up this broadcast and we'll continue Titus to show you what the church was told. The book must correct you. An elder has a massive responsibility. Don't just put them in some corner and use them to judge the saints and say, well, okay then, you sin, so come to a meeting with the elder and the deacons and let's let, let put you in three months suspension. That's not a job of an elder. Elders don't suspend people. They preach the truth and they convict you of unrighteousness. They govern the church by their example. Amen. If an elder cannot show an example, they should not believe in the church. They cannot rule the church if they cannot rule themselves. What example could you show the people of the Lord if your house is in disorder? 
if your children are chaotic. You can't even control the dog named Free Soul. How could you control your children? You have to have authority over your house. Rule it well. It doesn't mean to choose some bully and kick your wife and beat your wife up. No. If God is in any elder, your wife will see it. My mother respects my father. I respect my father. Why? Because I see Jehovah in him. I see the working of Jehovah in this man. I normally told him, and I close with this, I said, when I, when I used to, uh, 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 I was misbehaving at one time in my younger days. Misbehaving, behaving very bad. But I heard about the rapture. Listen to me. Whenever I misbehave in the city, or if somewhere else, I would call home. And I, if my father answered the phone, I said, yes! <laughs> Yehoshua didn't come. He didn't come, the rapture didn't take place because my father is still here. That's how much I saw this man. I love Errol London. This man showed me Yeshua in the earth. He showed me the image of Christ in the earth. He taught me self-sacrifice. He taught me discipline. And for that reason, I could preach with this passion I have because I could see an elder in living colors. I could see a bishop before my eyes. He doesn't lord over the church. He doesn't dominate people, but he stands for the truth though. You don't disrespect your wife around him though. You don't teach anything that's false with my father. That's the job of an elder. He corrects you in the scripture. How could elders lead the church and they do not even understand the fundamentals of the scripture itself? If your position was had by an election, it means you don't even understand the, the essence of how you function. You don't vote for you. You appointed by an apostle. Hear me. If your denomination does not have an apostle, you can't be an elder. Who put you there? The scripture said to the apostle Titus, you must set in order. You must appoint and you must ordain or set in place elders. Titus appoint elders. Paul the apostle is telling Titus to appoint elders. Now if you don't even have an apostle, who, how do you get appointed? How? And how could you as an elder be submitted to a pastor? This thing mixed up. Here in Guyana we call it cook-up rice. In Jamaica you call it one pot. Obama says they one pot. Peas and rice, it mixed up too bad. We have to get it fixed. If we don't get this thing fixed, we're going to be going round and round in circles, leading each other in a bunch of chaos. In, an, in chaos. Listen to me, church. We have to get this right. We have to get this right. And if the churches do not come to the place of respecting the apostolic gift, the prophetic gift, you will always function in chaos. You will invent doctrines. You, you, they were not even found in the Bible. You can't find them in the scripture you live in by them. You don't vote for doctrines. They're revealed to you. Yes. Yehoshua opened the mind of his disciples in Luke and so they could understand scripture. He opened the mind of the disciples so they could understand scripture. If ever scripture is not revealed to you, you'll teach letter which kills you. Yes. And if you don't even know the letter, now hold on, the letter will kill you. But in today's society, they don't even know the letter itself. Oh Much less to get revelation from it. Revelation is founded on the letter. It comes from there first. Then he opens your mind to get it. If you don't have fundamentals, fundamentals in the letter, how could you get revelation? So what people get is revelation that God said we must um, choose, vote for this one, vote for that one, make this female an elder, make the female uh, this, make the... Please, I'm almost speechless when I think about the church today. Let us bring it back in order. Let's bring it back in line. I pray that this message, as I always do, would meet you in truth. If you'd like to know where Commerce Jar Ministries is, it's located at 2093 Central Millions Ward. Ask any taxi driver or minibus driver where does Sir Thomas live, you'll find the place. You'll find where we are located. At 10 a.m. on Sunday, that's where you find Apostle Thomas and I. And you also, uh, and me, and you also get Wednesday night at 7.30. There's scriptural study, but I call, I call it development session as well. Feel free to fellowship with us. If you do not want to fellowship with us, please continue to view this broadcast if you are so led. If you bring this telecast and you're very angry tonight, it's a sign the truth is not in you. So begin to repent. So you could begin to be filtered. You could wash you and clean you now. Let the word wash you, let the word cleanse you. Because truth shall make you free. I bless you. I thank the Lord for you again and again. You shall remain in my prayer, Lyndon, because I believe with all my heart that this community can be restored if, like Nineveh, we repent and follow him. 
Blessings be to you. Amen and amen.